Did Yeshua come to disrupt the religious system of Judaism and replace it with a new religion called Christianity? He seemed to always be at odds with the religious people of his day. He confronted the religious authorities. He drove the money changers from the temple. He contrasted the old way of doing things with his new way. But if that's the case, why did Yeshua send the leper to the priests for inspection after he healed them? If he was already healed and Yeshua was coming to replace the priesthood, as many claim, why did he send him back to the priest for proof to them? Was he really as much of a renegade as we've made him out to be? Let's find out in this week's 5-Minute Torah. Welcome back, Shalomis. Welcome to another episode of 5-Minute Torah. Before we continue, here's a brief overview of this week's Torah reading. This week, we're studying the Torah portion of Metzorah, Leviticus 14, 1 through 15, 33. And here are the three things that you need to know about it. Number one, Tzara'at and Metzorah, the disease and the diseased. In most years, the Torah portions of Tazri and Metzorah are read together. This year, however, we are reading them separately because it's a leap year. However, the themes of these two Torah portions are integrally connected. In each of these portions, we discuss Tzara'at, Biblical Leprosy, and the Metzorah, the Biblical Leper. To clarify, Tzara'at is the disease and Metzorah is the one who has the disease. Where the portion of Tazria covers the detection and diagnosis of Tzara'at, Metzorah primarily covers the rituals that were to take place once the disease has subsided. Number two, strange rituals, purification of the Metzorah. The portion of Metzorah delves into the bizarre rituals required for the purification of a person who has recently recovered from Tzara'at. This involves a series of rituals, including the use of two birds, spring water, cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop. One bird is sacrificed and its blood mixed with water is sprinkled on the person who is being purified. The living bird is then released into the open field. Although we can't say with any definity how these rituals connect to the cleansing of the Metzora, they seem to be connected to the themes of renewal and rebirth. And number three, garments and homes, purification rituals extended. Our portion also addresses the purification process for garments and homes that show signs of Sarat, showing that spiritual and physical impurity can also extend to one's environment and possessions. The cleansing of these items reflects the broader theme of communal responsibility of maintaining purity and holiness within the home and in one's personal life. If you're looking for a place to learn, connect, and grow, then Shalom Macon is the place. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can find a connection with Shalom Macon through our live services every Saturday and through our private social network we call Shalom at Home. Check us out on YouTube and on our website at shalommacon.org for more information. We look forward to connecting with you and seeing you this Shabbat. This week's Torah commentary is called Cleansing the Leper and comes from my book, 5-Minute Torah, Volume 2. Nearly half of Parashat Mitzorah is concerned with the cleansing ritual for those who have been healed from Tzara'at, biblical leprosy, as we've said. The Mitzorah, the leper, had to undergo several strange rituals in order to solidify his purification, which included bringing several animals as offerings to the tabernacle or temple. The ritual began with an offering of two ritually pure birds, such as pigeons or turtle doves. One of the birds was slaughtered, and then the live bird bundled with a piece of cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and a branch of hyssop was dipped into the blood of the slaughtered bird. The blood was then sprinkled seven times on on the Mitzorah. He is pronounced clean, and then the live bird was released into an open field. But the ritual didn't stop there. After this, the Mitzorah shaved his entire body and underwent a ritual immersion. Once this was completed, he could come into the camp of Israel, but could not sleep in his tent. After a seven-day period, he shaved his entire body again and underwent another immersion. On the eighth day, he took three lambs and a grain offering to the temple, where one of the priests slaughtered the first lamb and put some of its blood on the right ear, the right big toe, and the right thumb of the former Metzorah. The priest then placed oil on the ear, the big toe, and the thumb with the blood on them and smeared oil over his freshly shaved head. Following this, the priest slaughtered the other two lambs, one for a sin offering and the other for an ola, a whole burnt offering. Although this ritual is extremely foreign and even freakish to the Western reader, 
We must remember that this is a procedure set in place by the same God who sent Yeshua to suffer on our behalf. We are reminded of this at the very beginning of the instructions. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, This shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing. Leviticus 14, 1 and 2. Today, the malady of Tzara'at does not exist. However, in the days of the Master, it still affected people living in the land of Israel. We have a few incidents recorded for us in the Gospels where Yeshua encountered lepers and brought healing to them. In each of these cases, Yeshua doesn't merely heal them and tell them to rejoin their families. He tells them to show themselves to the priests and undergo the purification ritual described above. Go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded for a proof to them. Luke 5.14 Yeshua wasn't trying to subvert the Torah. By having the man show himself to the priesthood and offer the prescribed sacrifices in the Torah, Yeshua demonstrated the intended interpretation of his teaching in Matthew 5.17, which he said, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. By doing this, he upheld both the commandments and the earthly function of the Levitical system. He showed that his forthcoming atonement work was not in competition with the Levitical priesthood and system, but that his work was greater than these and was the very thing upon which they were based. His sacrificial death and resurrection were in place long before the creation of the heavens and the earth. In the apocalyptic book of the Revelation, the Apostle John declared Yeshua to be, quote, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, 8. This pre-existing act of Yeshua is the basis for the entire Levitical sacrificial system. That is what the sacrificial system reflects and points toward. But why did Yeshua tell the Metzor to show himself to the priesthood for a proof to them? The first proof was that the man was healed. He was indeed healed and could be declared ritually clean. He could begin the process that would allow him to fully reintegrate into his community. The second proof was that a healer of lepers was indeed in Israel. This could have been a refutation of the Sadducean disbelief in a literal Messiah, since a healer of lepers had not arisen since the time of Elisha. The third proof was that Yeshua was indeed qualified as one who could lead his people as the righteous Messiah and not a lawless false prophet who had come to tempt the Israelites with signs and wonders. Take a look at Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5. By having the Messiah submit to the commandments, the authorities, and the procedures given in the Torah, Yeshua remained a lamb without blemish in regard to all of the righteous requirements of his Father. If he had instructed the man whom he had healed to veer from these instructions, he would have immediately invalidated himself as the anticipated Messiah of Israel. But Yeshua, the spotless lamb of God, followed his Father's instructions scrupulously and taught his disciples to do the same. As we've seen, the rituals of cleansing for a leper are heavily focused on the concept of ritual purity. Living outside of a temple context, how do you see the application for these laws today? I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Passover is upon us. It's traditional to study a text called Perkevot, or Chapters of the Fathers, in the weeks between Passover and Shavuot. If you'd like to see how studying Perkevot helps us understand the teachings of Yeshua, then you'll want to check out this six-part series that I did last year called Perkevot and the Teachings of Yeshua. It will not only give you an introduction to Perkevot, but also give you a fresh perspective on Yeshua's teachings. You can check it out using the link above or at the end of this video. I'll see you next week for another Messianic insight into the eternal Torah of God. Blessings from Shalom Make in the place where disciples of Yeshua learn, connect, and grow. Please visit our website, shalommakin.org, to learn more about us, join our live services, access other teachings, sign up for our newsletter, join our private network that will connect you with our greater community from around the world, or contribute to the work of Shalom Makin. Thank you for watching, and we look forward to connecting with you.